So I've noticed this tendency in both sort of Western or secular Buddhists and in reductionists uh, to sort of want to have their cake and eat it too in terms of empty individualism and closed individualism. So they want to sort of combine both of these views uh, as opposed to really accepting the implications of empty individualism, which is that it is equivalent to open individualism. So what am I talking about? Empty individualism is the view that uh, we have a whole bunch of points as experiences, and none of these points um, actually came from the past. Like, no one actually traveled from here to here, or from here to here. The, po the point is just a point. Um, and then we could talk about it from inside of one of these points. We could, you know, detect patterns and correlations and um, say that we came from this guy and not from some other person. Because it makes sense. Uh, we're, you know, we're far more similar to this guy than to this guy. Uh, but it, fundamentally, there was no magical essence. There was no soul traveling through time. So that's what empty individualism is really saying. Every experience just exists from its very inside, and that's it. And so this obviously implies open individualism. It implies that all experiences are just from their inside. Everywhere, right? So there is no um, guy who is born here and who then dies there. Like that oval which terminates in absolute oblivion uh, and began in oblivion doesn't make sense because then that's just closed individualism. That's just the view that you actually have a soul that has continuity. And so people like Sam Harris or this uh, replace the word soul with continuity of consciousness, which is the same thing. Um, and he should know better because I read his book when I was younger, Waking Up. And he brings up this example of what happens if we have two brains? What happens if we have a brain here and a brain here, and then we uh, combine, we merge half of this brain like this with this brain over here, and then the other half with the other half, right? Whose consciousness survives? Where does my consciousness go? Uh, which half? Where, you know, where am I going? So we have this strong sense of traveling through time, of being a self. Um, and he goes on to answer his own question, because it was a rhetorical question, and he says, there is nothing to account for. There was no self in the first place. So consciousness just exists from its own inside. Uh, but yet, he still seems to uh, believe in a, a fundamental sense of death, uh, that you just die, that you stop existing at some point, and that you began in, in, then to exist at some point. Um, so you can't do this. Um, this doesn't make sense. You can't be both a closed individualist and an empty individualist. And actually, the people who wrote the suttas 400 years after uh, the Buddha was supposed to have lived, uh, they realize this. They don't believe in uh, closed individualism, and they don't believe in reincarnation. Uh, what they talk about is uh, the unborn. Uh, Buddhism makes a big deal about this. Uh, this idea of the unborn. Consciousness was never born. And it will never die. It just exists from its own particular location. There is no flame traveling uh, through some particular path. Uh, the flame is in all locations where it is. It, it just, that awareness just exists from its very inside. That experience is just existing from its inside. And this is the same with a reductionist worldview. This is what Daniel Dennett would tell you. Daniel Dennett would tell you that when you have visual processing, that's just happening from its inside. It doesn't then have to go up to some um, other realm called consciousness. It's just some processing that is vision. And then you have some auditory processing, and that's just its own processing. It just exists from that moment in its own insight. There is no um, sort of ascent to some stage called consciousness. 
uh, that belongs to someone, that is constant. There is no constant stage uh, that contains your, your personhood. There's just the, there's just the processing itself, uh, wherever that's happening. Um, but then again, he will go on and still believe in that, like fundamental that, uh, in the atheistic sense of it, where you believe that experience just is obliterated. Um, but the, you know that would assume that you were in the first place this closed individual, this vesicle, um, carrying this this soul in the first place, which are not. Each point is its own experience. So these experiences, some of them, probably uh, most of them, that are trapped in some animal, um, which has to, which has developed a sense of time that has a parietal cortex to model objects and so on, um, as they travel through time, feels from its inside, this little point right there, feels like it came from the past. It didn't, it was just that experience existing from its own inside all along. Um, and then there are experiences that feel like they are eternal. They have no sense of uh, time and they're just there. And so then the question is, how do you get out? How is it that you're outside of an eternal experience? You would diverge into infinity and you would be trapped in it. Well, the answer is you are trapped in it. Uh, you are there. You are in all these experiences. Uh, except that from the inside of this one, it can't tell, obviously, because this is its own experience. It has its own um, set of information constraining it into what it is. Uh, but that, the, the point is there's only one canvas of the universe on which uh, these experiences can be painted. They don't belong to anyone. They're just existing from their own inside. So empty individualism, therefore, implies open individualism. You can't both believe a closed individualism and empty individualism. And then that would just be weird. I mean, what are, what are you really gaining from it if you still believe that you're traveling from moment to moment? Um, you're, you're just chopping it up, I guess. You're chopping your experience into more discrete sizes. And then that's all you're really contributing to the conversation. And it, it, it's so arbitrary. It doesn't make sense. The true physicalist perspective says you are all experience and can't tell from each location. So... We have a brain, right? And this brings up very interesting conundrums. Uh, so you have a brain. I'm very bad at drawing uh, brains, especially. So this is your brain, something like this, right? And let's look at visual processing. So with visual processing, you have um, your LGN, you've got V1, two, V3, um, and what was the other one? LOC, you've got your retina right here. So you get some visual input into your retina. This goes like this, to here, to here, to here, to here. And so the question is, how is it conserved? How is it conserved within a single brain and how am I not using your computational resources? So there must be some truth to some kind of binding. Like there has to be something accounting for why, um, you know, some experience from over here isn't seeping into here. Uh, either there is um, an importance to this time constraint, like there's a certain time interval, or maybe there's a standing wave pattern that is what causes the binding on top of the uh, discrete computational view of it. Um, so there has to be something of this kind in order to account for why you're not um, harvesting other computational resources from other regions. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is that with uh, th there's a mistake when we 
think that deep neural networks, for instance, which are very hot right now, um, that they're doing the same thing that we're doing. And they're not. They're just basing their perception on statistics. They're making their predictions on statistical patterns. That's why, uh, so the, the, the difference is that a human has uh, semantics. You have eyes and nose and mouth. And then these are all happening in different regions of the brain at different times, like the processing for the eye, the processing for nose, the processing for the mouth, and then at some other point, presumably it comes together, or your report that it was integrated comes together. Um, so that's the difference, and with deep neural networks, you're just doing statistics, because you could throw in a pixel here, and all of a sudden, you change that one pixel and it's no longer a face. It's like a bicycle. You know, it, you completely throw it off. And a human, you don't throw them off because we're doing something very different. We're actually constructing uh, an entire thing called a nose, an eye, a mouth. We have concepts for this, and then we unify them into face. Um, with, so this is uh, the binding problem. How did some of these points um, become unified? How do they actually relate? Whereas they don't relate to other random points. Like I'm not um, joining into my consciousness some information from some other person behind that screen over there. So how is that even happening? Um, this is actually an interesting problem. You wouldn't think it is if you, if you were just like a closed individualist who had this strong sense of time is sweeping forward for everyone. So you might think, oh, well, there's like this thing, which is obvious, which is now, and it's just across the entire universe sweeping forward, and that's just carrying you forward. But that is the Newtonian perspective, which was, uh, which is not relevant. Uh, relativity has replaced this. And we've had like 100 years to realize this, uh, but most people still haven't realized this. And if you don't realize that, I encourage you to go look up the theory of relativity. 